Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the 2020 edition of the Royal Tyrrell Museum Speaker Series. It's hard to believe, but it's actually, this is the 15th season that we're actually running the Speaker Series. So if you remember the first talk of the, of the series back in 2006, it just shows how long you've been sitting in the auditorium. So uh, to kick off the 15th season of the Speaker Series, the Royal Tyrrell Museum and its cooperating society are proud to present Dr. Christina Barclay. Christina is a recent graduate, a PhD graduate from the University of Alberta, having successfully defended her PhD just last week. And I think that's an accomplishment that, that is worthy of a round of applause. <laughs> so Christina is originally from Bigger, Saskatchewan, about an hour west of Saskatoon. She moved to Edmonton to pursue a bachelor's degree in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Alberta. And she loved it so much there that she decided to stay for her master's and her PhD degrees. For her master's, Christina studied the paleoecology and functional morphology of Devonian brachiopods and their un 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 encrustating organisms from the Western Canadian sedimentary basin. And for her PhD, she studied ocean acidification and predation in both modern and fossil mo marine invertebrates along the west coast of North America. And during the course of her PhD, Christina received a prestigious uh, Vanier scholarship, which allowed her to spend one year in California at the Bodega Marine Laboratory at, of the University of California, Davis, to study the effects of increased wa water acidity on snail shell growth when predators are present. Christina's research interests are in conservation paleobiology, or using the fossil record to make connections between the past, present, and future in an effort to help combat and protect ecosystems during climate change, uh, against climate change and human activity. She has spent three years working full-time in museums and science centers in Alberta and Saskatchewan, and she's very interested in public education and science communication. Today, Christina will present an overview of the research she has conducted during the course of her PhD. So without further delay, I present you Dr. Christina Barclay. Uh, thank you very much. I'm still getting used to that uh, title of Dr. Barclay. It feels kind of weird. Um, but yeah, so thank you everyone for braving the cold today and coming out to listen to me talk about crabs and snails for an hour. Um, so I guess I'll just start out as a uh, Francois mentioned that I'm from Saskatchewan originally. I'm a prairie kid at heart. I've always been fascinated by the natural world. And I spent a lot of time as a kid outside. My dad was an agrologist, so um, he would make my sister and I identify weeds. Um, but I was always more interested in animals. And I was also that kid that liked playing in the dirt. I liked rocks. I liked collecting minerals. And so you might imagine paleontology was sort of an early fascination for me that always seemed to stick. So <laughs> this is me circa the mid-90s. Um, I thank my parents very much for fostering that love of paleontology. And we made many summer trips to the Terrell Museum. And they really encouraged me to pursue uh, my passion and my interest for paleontology. So I ended up going to the University of Alberta, hopping the border over to Alberta to study paleontology. And of course, as a uh, kid, I really liked dinosaurs. That's sort of the big gateway fossil. <laughs> and that was sort of my goal. I wanted to study hadrosaurs, especially crested hadrosaurs. That's why I came to Alberta. Um, but along the way, I discovered this fascinating world of invertebrates. I've sort of always been drawn to the weird and the obscure. I've, you know, I'm a sucker for an underdog. And one of my first projects as an undergraduate was doing research on bryozoan evolution. And if you've never heard of a bryozoan, it's this little tiny colonial animal, kind of like a coral, um, but they're so small that you, to see an individual, you basically need some kind of hand lens or a microscope. And the idea that such complex animal life could exist at such a tiny scale, I found fascinating. So for my master's, I decided to pursue this a little bit more. And I looked at all these tiny encrusting organisms and the communities that um, exist in the Devonian of northern Alberta. 
so in northern Alberta, underneath the oil sands, we have this big formation of the mid-Devonian um, called the Waterways Formation, and it's this really nice reef system. We've got amazing brachiopod communities. So here's a brachiopod right here, this bivalved animal. They're, you know, kind of typical clam size. They're pretty small. And on them, the preservation is good enough that we get all these little tiny encrusting communities. And so I was really interested in this idea of how these organisms interact, having living encrusting organisms on a living host, and how do those organisms interact and influence one another. So this idea of biotic interactions, I thought, was really, really interesting and sort of has become one of the major themes of my career, is how do organisms interact and influence one another. So then when I decided to come back and do a PhD, the other thing that I discovered along the way is I really like this idea of practical uses of the fossil record and this field of conservation paleobiology. And so as one of the founders of conservation paleobiology, Carl Flessa would put it, it's putting the dead to work. We as paleontologists have access to this really cool um, thing that is the fossil record. And I really like the idea of making connections between paleoecology, organism interactions in the past and in the present, and trying to think about ways that we can actually protect and conserve ecosystems. So that's what I'm going to talk to you a bit about today, this foray I did for my PhD into modern ecology, and trying to make connections between modern ecology and the field of paleontology. So let's just jump right in. So there's increasing public awareness of things like how human activity has influenced the natural world. So things like climate change, um, habitat loss. There, and certainly this is one of the largest issues that scientists of our generation face, is how do we deal with the consequences of human activity on the natural world? And in particular, how do we conserve and protect the ecosystems that we might rely on and that we care about? And as paleontologists, we might consider ourselves somewhat removed from things like climate change. But again, the field of conservation paleobiology basically tells us that, no, we can use our tool, the fossil record, to help make connections and see patterns in the past, particularly because things like environmental disturbances and mass extinctions have occurred in the past. And we can actually see the before, the during, and the after events to say, OK, to modern ecologists, we have seen this happen before. This is what might happen if we continue to go down this path. And how do we protect and kind of make really efficient choices for how to conserve ecosystems? In particular, what I was interested in, again, thinking about biotic interactions, is predation. So if you think about predation, it's this really important component of ecosystems. Um, it's been a major driver of evolution over the history of life. So if you think about this constant arms race of prey having better defenses and predators having better weaponry, and this basically arms race that has led to the diversity and radiation of forms that we know today. And if we're thinking about predation in a modern context, we know that predators also influence the behavior of their prey. They can also influence the distribution of where those prey live. And if you think about something like a keystone species, if you're familiar with that term, that term actually comes originally from studies of predatory sea stars along the west coast of Washington, where scientists noticed the removal of this one single predatory species caused drastic changes to the structure of food webs in those ecosystems. So I think that's really cool and just shows the power of predators. So my question was, can we study predation through time? Specifically, if we're thinking about things like conservation paleobiology, can we use studying predation through time to uh, make connections between the past and present and future? And so bear with me here, but if you'll use this analogy of Ebenezer Scrooge in A Christmas Carol, he's visited by the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. And what does he do? He sees patterns. He makes connections, and he tries to make changes. So that's sort of the attitude I was going in to studying predation with, is can we actually look at predation through time 
and learn something to protect and conserve these ecosystems. Now, if you think about something like predation, even in the modern, you might think of like a BBC documentary where you have this dramatic music and there's a cheetah chasing a gazelle and then all of a sudden there's all this tension and then boom, there's a predation event that happens. But the truth is that it might have taken that film crew weeks to actually capture that shot because predation is a fast fleeting event and most of the time organisms, predators and prey are involved in other activities. And so it can be difficult and time consuming even for modern ecologists to study predation. And for us as paleontologists, well, our organisms have been dead for a very, very long time. So what are we supposed to do? We can't actually see predation happening. But we as paleontologists are very clever and we use lots of indirect evidence. We use proxies to help us study things like biotic interactions in the past. And one of those things that we can study is um, scars left on prey by predators. So if you think of something like bite marks on bone, or in the case of invertebrate fauna, we get these things called repair scars, which is basically some kind of shell-crushing predator coming up to a shelly invertebrate, trying to crush its shell, and if it can't, then it'll form this really nice scar that's evidence of a predatory attack. So here, this is a, a brachiopod again. You can see there was some kind of fish that tried to crush it. But what I'm more interested in is these things right here, this repair scar on things like snails that are caused by shell crushing crabs. Now, one of the reasons why we can use repair scars to study predation really easily in the fossil record is because it's easy to collect lots of data. There are more predators than there are, or sorry, there are more prey than there are predators. And things like mollusks, gastropods, preserve really, really well. And the other nice thing about these, these shelled mollusks is that they grow um, by accretion. So that means that basically every repair scar is left on the shell and we can actually see basically a story, a history of all the predation that has been experienced over the course of that prey's lifetime. So really easy to collect lots of uh, data. The other thing too is that predators like crabs often don't preserve as well in the fossil record. So things like mollusks have a much better fossil record. So easy to collect lots of data. And even in the modern, well, I'd rather deal with a bunch of snails than try and pick up some angry pinchy crabs. Uh, so the other nice thing is that we see repair scars in the modern as well. So we, this is a really nice system that we can look at connections because the same system exists in the fossil record and in the modern. So this is a great system to potentially look at predation through time is with these repair scars. The other thing is that successful shell crushing predation doesn't usually leave any evidence behind. So if you crush a shell, if you're a crab and you crush a shell, that shell is obliterated, it's gone. Both in the modern and the fossil record, you're not likely to see much evidence. And oftentimes with these repair scars or any predatory trace, we often know who the predator is. And in the case of these gastropods here, when a crab comes up to a gastropod and tries to crush it, It'll squeeze the shell. If it can't crush it, it switches to what we call a peeling method, where it grabs the shell and it start, sticks its claw in the aperture, or the lip, and it starts to peel the shell backwards. And snails are really good at retracting really high up into their shells, and so if this crab can't get to the snail, the snail will survive. And then we get this nice repair scar that forms. And it's always this kind of characteristic invagination that cuts across the growth uh, lines there. Really characteristic. It's so characteristic that in uh, snails, we actually have an ichnotaxon named for these predatory crab traces called cadicnus. So this is really nice, really diagnostic. As well, this crab gastropod system has been around since the Mesozoic. It's a really good model system for us to look at and try and make these connections between the modern and the false record. So basically, I was trying to set myself up for a success and use this nice model system. So my question then is, can we use this repair, or can we use repair scars, this proxy for predation, to study predation through time? So again, if you're thinking of Ebenezer Scrooge in A Christmas Carol, think of him being visited by the ghosts of predation past, present, <laughs> to help learn about the future. Um, so studying repair scars, though, is not without its challenges. 
So that's what I set out to work on for my PhD is to try and solve some of these challenges. And I'm just going to touch on a couple of them today that I worked on. But the first is that for these marine things like mollusks and gastropods, the way they construct their skeletons and their ability to construct and maintain their shells is affected by ocean chemistry. So they're pulling materials out of the water to make their skeletons. So ocean chemistry has changed in the past. And it's also a major concern today. So if you've heard the term ocean acidification come up before, it's this increasing concern that by the end of the century, are there going to be changes that's going to inhibit um, shelly animals from making their shells? So if you're thinking about that in the context of predation, that's really important, being able to maintain and build your skeleton. That's a, the, your way of resisting predation. And so I was really interested in exploring this idea of ocean acidification in terms of what's going to happen not only in the future, but can we actually see this in the past? Because ocean acidification has occurred in the past. So can we make connections that way? Um, and then the second thing that I want to talk to you about today is one of the problems that we've been dealing with when, in the study of repair scars is that repair scars are actually failed attacks. So again, if you think about successful predation, the shell is crushed, it doesn't really leave any evidence. So we only have this failed predation, uh, these repair scars that we can look at. And so this causes some ambiguity in what a repair scar actually means. So for example, if you had two assemblages separated either by space or time, and one assemblage has more repair scars, does that mean that there were more attacks and you're getting a greater predation intensity? Or is there a change in how successful the predators themselves are? Are you seeing more scars because the predators are more likely to fail, and so you're getting more failures, and that's why you're seeing more repair scars? So this is a really big issue that if any of you have ever um, dealt with repair scars, um, this comes up again and again as a major issue and a major kind of roadblock for studying things like repair scars. So here is my study system. Again, I made this little foray into modern ecology for most of my PhD, um, basically to have this model system that I could test in the modern and then kind of explore in the past. So my predator here is this shell-crushing crab um, called Cancer Productus, the red rock crab. It is um, a pretty abundant crab along the west coast. It's actually red rock, or rock crabs in general are a pretty important economic fishery. That was one of the reasons I was interested in it. But also, uh, shell crushing crabs, again, have been around for a very long time, since the Mesozoic. And um, the other thing, too, is that in these rocky intertidal systems along the west coast, uh, there's evidence to suggest that crabs also act as keystone predators, like those sea stars. So they're really important players in their ecosystems. And then the two of the prey species that I was interested in looking at were this snail right here, um, which if you've ever been to the west coast and you've been tide pooling, you've probably come across uh, this guy here. The black turban snail is really, really dense. It's probably one of the most common intertidal snails out there. So really important food source for crabs. Um, and then this one as well, Nucella, it's a dog whelk. So it drills mussels and barnacles to eat them. It's also a very, very common snail um, along the west coast. So all three of these are major players in their ecosystems along the west coast of North America. The other thing, too, with uh, all of these, but in particular our two snails here, is that they have a really good fossil record, particularly Tegula. So long uh, into the Pleistocene of California, we've got lots of fossil material. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. So for my first challenge, I wanted to know how things like ocean acidification affect prey defenses because, again, your integrity of your shell, that's your means of resisting predation. And so if ocean chemistry is affecting how strong your shell is or how big your shell is, that's a major problem. So for those of you, I promise this is the only chemistry slide, um, but for those of you that aren't familiar with what ocean acidification actually is, because sometimes it's, it's thrown around as a buzzword, um, basically what happens is as carbon dioxide emissions increase, those carbon dioxide emissions are absorbed by the oceans where they combine with seawater to form an excess of hydrogen and bicarbonate ions. 
And in particular, it's this excess of hydrogen ions that causes a problem because it bonds really readily with carbonate ions that are naturally found in seawater. The issue there being that carbonate, it, car carbonate ions are one of the main building blocks of calcified shells in things like mollusks, coral. So if this carbonate bonds with hydrogen instead of being used to make skeletons, that means that there's less carbonate available for things to build their skeletons. So this is one of the reasons why ocean acidification is a concern for basically the end of the century. The other reason why I chose these two particular snails is because uh, they have different shell materials. So when we're talking about a calcified structure, um, there's two main polymorphs of uh, calcite that organisms use to secrete their skeletons. And the first is called aragonite, and that is in tegula, uh, the black turban snail. So it uses that aragonite nacre, that mother of pearl material, to build its skeleton. Whereas nucella, on the other hand, has a shell that's made mostly of calcite. Now the issue with aragonite versus calcite is that there's trade-offs here between how resistant you are to dissolution versus how resistant you are to predation. So aragonite is a very strong material, um, whereas calcite is a little bit weaker. But on the other hand, aragonite is uh, more susceptible to dissolution, so there's this potential trade-off here, whereas calcite is more resistant to dissolution. So there's this interesting trade-off that I wanted to explore. And so what I wanted to do is basically do a modern experiment to establish a baseline that not only we could use to help predict what might happen at the end of the century um, or into the future, but also help us interpret and figure out, okay, this is like sort of a baseline of what might happen and what might have happened in the past. So making that connection again between the future and the past. And what I wanted to measure in terms of prey defenses is first growth, so how big you are, the bigger you are generally, how well you can grow, the, um, the more resistant you're going to be to predation. As well, I wanted to look at shell strength itself and see how that was affected, the integrity of your shell. And then finally, I wanted to look at the structure of the shell and how those shells might actually be affected by ocean acidification. So I went down to Bodega Marine Labs in California with UC Davis and set up an experiment where I had living snails of tegula and nucella that I exposed to different pH conditions for six months and just let their shells grow and see what happened. So uh, yeah, I had an ambient control condition, which is basically what the water was today uh, coming out of the pipes in the lab. And then I simulated uh, pH conditions for what we expect at the end of the century, but also what we've seen in the past in terms of ocean acidification in the fossil record. And this is what happened after six months of growth. So this, this first diagram here is just looking at their shell growth. So you can see tegula right here, the red is the low pH conditions. It was pretty scary. <laughs> six months, half of them didn't grow at all. Um, pretty frightening. Uh, but on the other hand, what was really interesting is nucella seemed totally fine. It wasn't affected, its growth wasn't affected by pH at all. So that was really interesting and unexpected. Uh, so here's what it looks like. So again, snails have this really complicated coiling growth pattern, but this is a top-down picture. So imagine you're looking at the snail from the top down, and it, so it's growing in this coiled direction, and right here I've got nail polish lines. That was where I started the experiment. So everything clockwise is new growth during the course of the experiment over those six months. And so here's my ambient tegula. They did okay. And then here's my low pH. This one actually did grow. And again, half of them didn't at all. So pretty scary. But then if you look at nucella over here, the two pH treatments look the same. They were fine. They didn't seem to be bothered by pH in terms of their growth. So I thought that was kind of weird and kind of interesting. All right. And then I looked at shell strength. So if you think about it, your ability to actually resist that crushing force is really important. So not only if you're bigger, you have a better chance of uh, resisting predation, um, but if you are really strong, you also can resist predation that way as well. 
So here along the y-axis is actually strength of the four. I basically crushed these shells in a special um, machine called an Instron, and it measures the amount of force that it takes to crush these shells. So the interesting thing with tegula is that not only do they grow less, but they're also 50% weaker. So they're getting this double whammy of, OK, they're not as big, so they're not as strong. But regardless of size, they're also 50% weaker when they're exposed to low pH. So they're getting this double whammy. Um, and right here, I've marked the 200 Newton line, this dotted line right here. The reason I've put that in there is those are conservative crushing forces for things like red rock crabs. So having that pH was enough to push a lot of these specimens down into that crushing range. So that's kind of scary. That's not typical for them. And then Nucella, the results aren't as strong, but you'll see that, again, regardless of the fact that their growth was OK, their shells were still about 10% weaker, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it's a difference of about 40 newtons. And if you asked me to apply 40 newtons of force on your finger, you would definitely feel that. So then the question is why? What's happening to these shells to not only cause these different responses, but to cause this weakness of the shells regardless of their growth in the case of Nucella? So what I did is I scanned a bunch of them using a micro CT scanner to see what the density, what's happening to the density of the shells. So here's some cross-section images of micro CT scans. And you'll see that these are the two low pH treatments here. You'll notice that there's cooler colors around the outside of both specimens, those are lower densities. So in both cases, I had lower densities in low pH treatments. The other thing too is with Nucella, notice that the shell is sometimes thinner in places, but it also has these really rough, jagged edges along the exterior. So basically, they can't maintain their skeletons. There's dissolution happening to those shells, and it's acting from the outside. They can't keep up, um, probably because these waters are undersaturated in those carbonate ions, so they're starting to dissolve. And then when you look at tegula under an SEM microscope, this is what the shell surface of a normal ambient shell looks like, so it's pretty smooth. But then when you look at a low pH treatment, you see all this rough, coarse texture. There's a lot of pitting. It's sometimes referred to as a sugary texture. And then these bottom two images are also of tegula, but these are now cross sections um, into the shell surface. So this is the outer layer, and you can see there's a lot of pitting going on. But even in that inner nacreous layer, that aragonite layer, you're still seeing quite a bit of pitting going on. So the shells are basically being affected by dissolution. So how does ocean acidification affect these prey defenses? Well, the shells in both species are going to be more vulnerable to predation, either because they're smaller in the case of tegula and or because they're weaker in the case of both tegula and nucella. And why is that happening? Well, their shell microstructure, especially from the outside, that external surface, is starting to dissolve. So that has huge implications, obviously, for the future of these two snails. But now when we're thinking about it in the terms of the fossil record, um, when we're looking and trying to find evidence of ocean acidification in the fossil record, this might be some evidence that we can look for is if we see a change in the size at which those repair scars occur. So, for example, if you have an event where you're suspecting in the fossil record that there's ocean acidification going on, and all of a sudden you see repair scars start to get bigger, and you only see repair scars on big things, that could be evidence that those shells are weaker because the crabs are less likely to fail until you get to those larger sizes. So you're only starting to get failures on larger things. The other thing you could potentially look at is asymmetrical effects on prey. So if you see things that have similar shell structures to tegula, um, not doing very well. But things like tegula, or sorry, nucella doing OK, that might also be evidence of ocean acidification in the fossil record. All right, so challenge number two. Now I wanted to look at whether or not we can interpret repair scars either spatially um, or through time. And again, this issue with looking at repair scars, one of the big challenges that we have is if we have these two assemblages that we're trying to compare in terms of predation and repair scars, if we see a change in the number of repairs, is that due to a change in how successful the predator is or a change in predation intensity, the number of attacks? So for example, if we saw 
an increase in the number of attacks, it could be because the predators are less successful, they're more likely to fail, they're not as good, so they're, you see more failed repair scars, or is it simply just that they have, they're being attacked more often, um, and vice versa. So one thing that we can use to help interpret between these two scenarios is the size at which repair scars occur. So I call that size at repair. So if you're thinking again from the top down, looking at this snail, as it starts to grow, it grows in this coiling pattern. It's all very happy, but then boom, there's a predation event and a repair scar forms. That snail survives though, and it continues to grow until boom, you get another predation event, another repair scar forming. And then it continues to grow until its current size. The thing is that the, if we see this change in the size at which repair scars occur, it can potentially tell us how successful the predator is. So for example, if you see an assemblage with only small attacks and nothing big getting attacked, it could tell you that the predator is only capable of attacking those smaller things and it's more likely to fail on small things. It can't attack big things. But then if you see a switch and repair scars start happening at these larger sizes and not at the smaller sizes, it might mean that the predators are more successful, they're less likely to fail on those smaller individuals, and they're only likely to start failing on the bigger, older things. So here's another example of basically what I did. <laughs> so imagine me going out and collecting a bunch of data on snails and repair scars, and this is sort of what it looks like. So imagine that you have these two assemblages here of repair scars. The one on the left here has more repairs, and the one on the right has fewer repairs. But what you'll notice is, okay, let's say we want to know whether there's a change in success or a change in the number of attacks. Um, you'll notice here that these repair scars on this assemblage are all larger, and these ones are all smaller. So what does this likely indicate when you're comparing these two samples? There's a change in predator success happening, with one assemblage being more successful, these larger attacks, and the smaller attacks potentially indicating that the predator is less successful. So here's the same scenario, but now you'll notice same number of repair scars, but they're all occurring at the same size. So what does that mean? It probably just means that there's a change in the number of attacks happening. Okay, so if you took those snails and you plotted them onto a histogram, this is what it looks like. So along the x-axis here, is basically the size at which the repair scars are occurring, or the size of the body. So the size of the repair scars is always, I'm gonna show it in red, and the size of the snails is always in blue. So if you see a shift along the x-axis in terms of size, if you see a shift this way, that might mean there's larger repairs, they're more successful. A shift downwards would be something that's less successful, a predator that's only attacking and scarring things at smaller sizes. And along the y-axis here, this is just frequency, so it's just a histogram. So the higher the peak is, that would indicate that there are more attacks, and the lower the peak is, there are fewer attacks. So if you see it in the same spot along the x-axis, but just shifting up and down, that would just be a change in the frequency of attacks. So first, I wanted to test this in a modern system along a latitudinal gradient. So what I did is I went to the west coast, and I collected something like 5,000 uh, snails and looked at them for repair scars. And this is in living, modern, intertidal uh, snails here. So this my little tegula right here. From four different regions, I think I had 28 sites um, from BC, Oregon, Northern California, and Southern California. So I just wanted to see, are there any changes latitudinally in terms of repair scars along the West Coast? And this is what the data look like. So you'll notice here in this little box and whisker plot, um, basically there's really, really high percentage of repairs. So quite a few things in BC and Northern California getting attacked. So really high rates of repairs. And it's really, really low in Southern California. Um, it's also lower in Oregon. Now, I remember those histograms I showed you. Basically, this is what real data look like on those histograms. But you'll notice here that... Um, the distribution of the red, the, where the attacks are occurring, versus the distribution of the blue, the size of the animals, is the same between BC, Northern California, and Southern California. So those distributions of those two curved lines are the same. So that means that there's no change in success. But what you'll notice is that in Oregon, 
there's a shift along the x-axis where all of the repairs are now happening only at larger sizes. So that might be evidence that for some reason in Oregon, crabs are more successful. And we don't really know why that is, but there's some anecdotal evidence to suggest that uh, repair, or sorry, crabs in Oregon might be larger and might be stronger too. Um, and that's just because things like size catch limits are larger in Oregon, but we don't really know why. So this is some evidence of changes in repairs that we can actually use to maybe look and investigate why are things different in Oregon. Then I wanted to look at this, okay, through time. So instead of changing spatially, I looked at the same place, but through time. So I went to the LA County Museum in, uh, in Los Angeles, the Natural History Museum there, and looked at a whole bunch of Pleistocene tegula. So in Southern California, we get these deposits called terrace deposits, and basically it happens during interglacial periods in the uh, Pleistocene. So the climate and everything during these interglacial terrace deposit uh, periods is very, very similar to today. So there's nothing to suggest that anything between the Pleistocene and today would be different. So um, the age of the Pleistocene material was about 120 to 80,000 years old, so a little bit of time averaging going on, but pretty good, right? Um, and still separated from the modern by about 80,000 years. So everything about these things should be the same. I basically chose my modern sites based on where that fossil material had come from. And so what did the data look like? So the interesting thing here is that you'll notice again where the red is, the size of the attacks, the size of the repairs, is the same relative to the size of the snails in both the Pleistocene and the modern. So that indicates that the success of the crabs hasn't changed since the Pleistocene. So if we're comparing these two, any changes to repair scars is likely an indication that um, there is a change in the number of attacks. And what you'll notice here is the frequency of attacks in the modern is a lot less than it is in the Pleistocene. That's really interesting. So how do we re interpret repair scars through space and time? Well, we can use these methods, uh, like measuring the size of an attack and comparing the distribution of those repair scars, the size at repair, to the distribution of the overall snails in those sites. And the really interesting thing, I think, is that I've got two independent lines of evidence here to suggest that for some reason, there are fewer crab attacks in the modern of Southern California. So that would be compared to Northern California today and BC, for example, but also compared to the Pleistocene material. And I'm suggesting that it's potentially because humans are overfishing crabs. And I'm not just tossing that out willy-nilly. Um, there's some other evidence to suggest that maybe crabs are being overfished. So there's data modeling projections that suggest that crabs, rock crabs in Southern California are potentially being overfished. Um, Crab fishermen have also noted that they're getting fewer catches than they would expect. And the really important thing here when we're thinking of the, the applications of the fossil record in terms of conservation paleobiology is that this tool is really important to show that there's something maybe going on with crabs because crab fisheries today, we don't have very much data. They're really hard to manage because of that. They're generally considered least concern. So we can actually, as paleontologists, say, look, maybe we need to look into this a little bit more and put some higher restrictions on what's happening with uh, crab fisheries, especially in overpopulated, heavily populated areas like Southern California. So in terms of implications for us as paleontologists, I think that this method that I've come up with can be really, really useful for looking at patterns through time as well. So, for example, if we see changes in the size of attack, the size of those repair scars through time, it could be evidence of like selective pressures going on. So, I think we could look at something like if we see an association between uh, changes in repair scars and the number of repairs and anti-predatory adaptations in things like mollusks. So, mollusks, uh, especially in the late Cretaceous of places like Alberta, there's this really important event that's starting to happen called the Mesozoic Marine Revolution. We're getting all these new shell-crushing predators that start to show up, and mollusks, their evolution kind of goes berserk in response. 
So I think it would be really interesting to look at things like repair scars and um, measure them in association with things like mollusk evolution and the evolution of anti-predatory adaptations. And some place like Alberta would be an excellent place to test that. So coming back full circle to this question of whether or not we can study predation through time, I obviously would argue yes. And I think, I hope that my research has sort of laid this foundation that we can actually use to understand and interpret repair scars, what might affect them, and what that might mean in terms of making connections between the past and the present. And like Ebenezer Scrooge, hopefully make those connections between ecology and paleontology, make pr predictions that help protect these ecosystems that we love and that we care about, and use things like predation and repair scars to do so. And with that, uh, I have a ton of people to thank that helped me with research along the way. And thank you for your time and for listening.